Last semester, Karina and I had the privilege of participating in a seminar for graduating students in international development with Professor Kim Samuel, who is here with us tonight. And the course was called Overcoming Social Isolation and Building for Social Connectedness Through Policy and Program Development. Quite the mouthful. <laughs> Throughout the semester, our class formed a strong community, both inside and outside the classroom. As evidenced by the number of students in our class here this evening, our community is still alive and well. The sense of belonging that we felt inspired us to continue the conversation around building bridges between students and professors across disciplines and faculties. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from five professors, all who are using innovative techniques and practices, whether they know it or not, to enhance the university experience to, of each student that they encounter. Thinking about our own struggles to transition from high school to university, we've come to realize the importance of having professors who truly care about their students early on, professors who think of us as more than just a number. As I reflect on these last four years, I feel so lucky to have been able to find that sense of belonging early on. Thanks to a select few professors, some of whom are in this room tonight, who made me feel like a valued member of this large community. With graduation just around the corner, the university has become a lot smaller, as I've formed many strong relationships with more professors and more students. But I continue to value those classroom experiences that I had early on and throughout my degree, where I really felt like I had a sense of purpose here at this university. And looking back on these years, what we will remember most are the interactions we've had, the friendships we've made, the communities we've been a part of, the knowledge we gained. But perhaps most importantly, we'll remember those professors who created classroom environments where we felt valued, respected, and could find a sense of belonging in a university that at times can feel unfathomably large. The goal of this event, in part, is to highlight and celebrate professors from different faculties who are fostering a sense of community and belonging for all students. In gathering the professors here today, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the incredible educators who have made this university feel a little bit smaller and more connected for all students. In particular, we would like to thank the five amazing panelists who agreed to share their insights tonight and guide our conversation. And now before we move into the evening, we'd just like to take a moment to give thanks to those who did help make this event possible tonight. So we'd like to thank Professor Kim Samuel for believing in us and giving us this opportunity to co-create this event with her. And we'd like to thank Patrick Brennan and the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill and the Jean Sauvé Foundation for all of their support. Finally, we would like to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight to be a part of this conversation. We would now like to invite Patrick Brennan to say a few words. Good evening, thank you for coming. I am here tonight in my capacity as a senior fellow at the Jean Sauvé Foundation. I'm also executive director of the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill University. Just a few words on the Jean Sauvé Foundation. We're an international leadership development and capacity building organization, investing in both great individuals but also great ideas. And our mission is to connect, engage, and empower next generation public leadership addressing key global challenges. And as many of you may know, there is a formal agreement between McGill and Jean Sauvé in terms of the fellows who go through those doors. And I think events of this nature are strengthening that. The foundation has developed a unique leadership development model. It focuses on transforming outstanding young change agents into globally minded public leaders and game changers. Since 2003, the Foundation's programs have empowered over 150 young leaders from over 50 countries. And this is done through three broad pillars. The Public Leadership Program, which is the flagship leadership development program at the Foundation. The Network, where we seek to catalyze collaboration among our community members, especially fellows, and the Forum through which we hope to create a virtual as well as physical space for sustained public conversations and thought leadership on issues of global significance. It is under the auspices of that last activity, our form, 
that we're thrilled to co-host this event today in collaboration with Professor Kim Samuel, whom I'll be introducing in a moment. Building on the success of our fall series, this is the last lecture in our winter series, the Jean Sauvé Forum on Social Connectedness and International Development. During the winter series, we have hosted stimulating encounters with inspiring professionals who are on the front lines of these twin issues. The series would not be possible without the support and collaboration with Professor Samuel, a partner and longtime friend of the Foundation. And before I do introduce Professor Samuel, who is a, a friend and colleague, for those of you who are heading out into the world as international development practitioners, I just leave with you the fact that these, the social dimension that is being brought forward, not only through this work, but through many of the efforts of people in the room, is often the glue that is forgotten when policies and programs are put in place, partially implemented, and then people, it dawns on them that the social dimension should have been something that was thought about first. In introducing Professor Samuel, she has over two decades of leadership experience in business, philanthropy, development of, of multi-stakeholder partnerships, and academic research. A pioneer in the field of social isolation and connectedness, Ms. Samuel combines academic research, writing, and lecturing with direct programmatic and partnership building experience supporting communities across the globe facing diverse challenges. Her work focusing on social isolation as a critical, experiential, and measurable component of multidimensional poverty underscores the importance of social connectedness to human dignity and human rights struggles globally. There is more that I can say about Kim, but I merely want to welcome her now. I want to ensure everyone has enough time here this evening to speak. And uh, again, thank you for coming. My name is Kim Samuel, and as Patrick mentioned, I am Professor of Practice at ISID. This is our, our final uh, event in the, in the winter series. It should be noted that there, there wasn't a fall survey series at all until we decided to create one. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of December, I was already missing having a class and, uh, wondered, and wondered what that was going to feel like not being here at all. And then the uh, Sauvé Foundation asked if, well, you're going to continue on in the winter. I thought, well, maybe not every week, because I, I don't live in Montreal, but what about every month? And, uh, and so here we are, and this is our grand finale, and we're looking forward to, to uh, continuing on in September as if there has always been and always will be a Sauvé uh, lecture series on social connectedness. My life's work has focused on the problem of social isolation which is a crippling condition that has taken root over decades of our failure as a society to respect, reciprocate, and to recognize the voices of our most vulnerable members. I believe that we can solve this problem through awareness, empathy, inclusivity, caring. I don't believe that the word soft should go in front of anything other than, uh, than a marshmallow. Um, or pillows, but certainly not in terms of skills, because the kind of skills that we were talking about in, in class and that, that I think we'll be talking about tonight could be called soft skills. And, and actually, I, I would argue that they're the most, the most important ones in how we create an environment for learning. Uh, I've been honored to engage with the wider McGill community through my capstone seminar with ISID, and I very much hope to be having another one um, this fall. And as always, I would like to thank the Sauvé Foundation, and in particular, Diane Sauvé, as well as Dean Mayoni, the Foundation Chair, for their partnership. I also want to thank Patrick, on a very serious note, for his steadfast support in launching this new field of study. And in as much as the speaker series is all about exploring isolation and finding ways to bolster connectedness, I want to say how much I have valued building community with all of you this year. Our topic tonight is teaching with compassion, holistic approaches to building community in the university classroom. For me, it's a perfect 
capstone to a perfect capstone and a tribute to a wonderful year. Because while all of our gatherings have been very special, this one is unique. It brings to life what I think education is meant to be, where we're all engaged with each other and we're all learning and sharing and creating knowledge together. And as I stand here with two of my awesome students who have co-created this evening with me, or, or better, I with them, I find myself thinking back to my first class, my first day as a teacher. I know that that word isn't used a lot around university, but that's what I see myself as. I see myself as a, as a teacher and someone who has fulfilled the promise of her nine-year-old self who one day thought, I'd like to be a teacher when I grow up. Anyway, back to the first day. It was a very hot day. The sun was blazing, and I was frankly overdressed. I was feeling a lot of anxiety, like I really didn't know what I was doing, and I really didn't want it to show. For those of you who remember a whole huge ad campaign that became a slogan for a long time and is still used in popular language, never let them see you sweat. Well, I was sweating quite a bit, so that wasn't working. It was like butterflies, only heavier. And right on time, the students started coming into the classroom. It needs to be pointed out to all of you who are not my students here tonight that right on time for me was actually five minutes later than I thought class began. So I was already thinking at 8.35 that this was, this was just not going well at all and people are late and are we gonna, how are we going to make up the time? Anyway, I got through that. I was so nervous, though not quite believing in myself and thinking that Isid had been wrong to believe in me. But then I remembered why I was here. I reminded myself that this matters. I thought to myself as I prepared for the first class ever in my life that everyone here is going to give me a chance. As long as they know I am here for them, my students will be there for me. They put up with me having big cards like, like those for each person's name, and then I realized that you can't read tent cards with written in, in, uh, in any color pencil as it's going up and down rows, and then name, name tags. It was all to learn your names. And then it still wasn't working, so when I had guest speakers come in, I would say, make sure when a student is going to ask you a question or make a comment that you ask them their name. Well, that's not necessary. No, it really is necessary, because that's how I'm going to learn them. <laughs> well, anyway, the fact that they're still here more than three months since our class ended is the best gift I could ever receive. To all my awesome students, thank you for all you've done and for all you are going to go on to achieve. As my class knows, tonight is BYOP, Bring Your Own Professor. I'm sure there are some people in this room who are naturally born great teachers but I'd bet that I'm not the only instructor to feel the kind of insecurity I just described. Because in many cases, for all the focus on scholarship and research expertise, university professors receive far less encouragement for mastering the art of teaching. And to that rigorous institutional requirement for success in academia, the demands of being on a tenure track and the pressure to publish or perish can make this a pretty challenging predicament, even if you were born to teach. Even when a resource like McGill's Teaching and Learning Services exists, university faculty may feel there just isn't enough time or incentive to pursue it, and that's a real shame. Because for all the importance of deep subject matter expertise, there is a difference between viewing teaching as presenting subject matter content and viewing teaching as truly helping students learn. So perhaps it's not surprising that many students report they have little personal connection with their professors. And I want to be clear, I'm speaking broadly here, 
not about McGill per se. In the United States, for example, the most recent national survey of student engagement found that 34% of first year students say they never discussed course topics or ideas with a faculty member outside of class. 50% say they never worked with a faculty member on anything other than coursework. But I would submit that by failing to treat the classroom as a community, we are doing a grave disservice to students and faculty alike. We're missing an opportunity to use the classroom as a place to create and support belonging, well beyond whatever subject matter is being taught. And as a result, we're missing a chance to make our campuses the best possible learning environments they can be. For so many students, the transition from high school to university is enormous. It may be their first time away from home, a new city, even a new country, a demanding course load, and no friends to start. So often, they're left to find their way on their own to navigate all these changes in a place where no one knows their name, where it's easy to feel invisible. It's not to say that services and bridges don't exist, but sometimes it's hard, I think, to make your way over to one to cross it if you're feeling like you're sitting at the bottom of a well. We've heard about the loneliness epidemic on this campus, about a lack of common rooms and communal space, about students feeling pressured to put studying before socializing, about competition trumping community. We've heard students say that it's impossible to feel seen in a lecture hall the size of a movie theater. We've heard that roughly 10% of McGill students have seriously considered attempting suicide while here. And again, I'm not singling out this university. There's statistics like this all around the world. In fact, just last month, Carolyn Samuel wrote about coming upon a student sobbing uncontrollably on the floor of a washroom stall at the McLennan Library. It was this student's first semester, and she was worried she was falling behind. So Dr. Samuel tried to comfort the student and escort her to the Dean of Students. But the girl suddenly stopped and still crying exclaimed, I can't go. I have to be in class now or I'll fall behind even more. Is this really what any of us think a university education should be about? Something is broken and I believe everyone will benefit if it can heal. As I said at the outset, my life's work to combat isolation by cultivating connectedness is what drives me every day. At its root, that depends on the understanding that every person matters. Education is indispensable in that effort and can be both an end and a means. Yet, it's essential to raise awareness about these issues. But it's also essential to act. When it comes to education, conventional wisdom used to be that the three R's that were really important were reading, writing, and arithmetic. Please ignore for a moment that only two of those actually begin with the letter R. And ask yourself, are those the most essential skills for success in today's world? I've come to believe there are an additional three R's that should be part and parcel of scholarship. These three R's, essential to building social connectedness, are respect, recognition, and reciprocity. Those were the pillars on which I wanted the student experience in my own capstone classroom to rest. Even as our topic was how to deepen inclusion for marginalized communities around the world, I wanted, with my students, to create a community right here and a deep feeling of connectedness among us. I wanted our classroom to be a place where everyone knew that their voices were valued and heard, where differences were welcomed, and everyone was seen and accepted for who they are as a whole person, 
not just as a number or a grade, but an individual worthy of respect and worthy of care. I wanted to foster social interaction and support both inside and outside the classroom so every member of our community would feel secure and no one would feel alone and certainly no one would feel less than, less than anything. And what I found was that the more secure my students felt, the more engaged they became in our class, the more excited they were about the material, the more I saw of them in office hours and elsewhere, and the more we all learned together. As one of my students eloquently said, education grows when connection grows. And many of them drew on their friendships from class to help them grow and flourish in other areas. These friendships continue to blossom. I see it with my own eyes, and it brings me great joy. Of course, I realize that the freedom of not being a traditional academic makes this a little bit different. I'm a professor of practice. I'm not pursuing tenure. My passion revolves around teaching. But I know that there are many what I call professor professors who share that passion too, who are called to higher education, not simply because they love a particular field of study, but because they have a keen desire to share and engage with young minds. One day, I was talking with my students about their favorite professors at McGill. In every case, the professors they named were respected experts in their field. We would expect that. But what stood out for my students wasn't simply the intellect of their professors. Most of all, it was their heart. It was the actions their favorite professors took to show their students how much they cared. I joked with my students at the time saying, I really want you to remember that what you're telling me about is your second favorite professor. <laughs> We've got some of those amazing favorite professors here tonight for what I know will be a wonderful discussion. And what makes me even more excited is that my students are in the lead. I had wanted to do this event this coming fall, but Jessica Farber and Karina Adabai are graduating in May, and they didn't want to wait. So they've co-chaired it. They put it together with the support and enthusiasm of the whole class community. And I also want you to know it's not lost on me that everybody's coming at the time of exams and term papers and all that other stress. So it means a lot that you're here. And now all of us can learn from each other, and most especially from the examples set by the dedicated faculty here on the panel and in BYOP. I now have the great honor of introducing the, uh, the professors that are here today, and I, uh, I'm going to do this in a, in a pro slightly unorthodox way because I'm going, I'm going to uh, give you their brief bio. Each case is impressive, but then I'm going, I have a note that's Karina and Jessica, Jessica and Karina, what, what they told me as to why each of you are invited. Because because one of the things when we were talking about this, and it was a group of us, we still get together. It was a class, we were all just getting together and talking, and it was something that Jessica said, you know, we're all graduating. And most of us don't really get a chance to say thank you. To say thank you to the professors that have helped shape your lives and direction and your experience here. And, and when Jess said that, everybody chimed in. And, and our class, uh, others in the class created a, we have a, the, the class has a, a social connectedness Facebook page. And there are all sort of comments about this. So I just think it's really important for professor professors to know, <laughs> uh, and professors of practice to know, that you're really valued. And it's kind of like anything. Sometimes you don't get to hear the best things that are said about you. and and. And hopefully someone else will come and say, did you hear? Do you know what? So this is kind of a night, right, for, for the BYOP, bring your own professors. The professors on the panel 
others that have come, and others around this campus to really celebrate and honor teaching in, uh, in the way that we're talking about it in terms of building community and also just making that extra difference in your student's life. And you have no idea how they're going to take that forward. That, that's the exciting part to get to see. So I will uh, now introduce, and just to prepare the panelists, that once I've done that, I'm going to introduce each one of you, and then uh, have um, kind of a general, a general question to reflect for a few minutes, but just know that you can also take it wherever you want, and then get into uh, really hard-hitting questions, and they won't be hard-hitting. Uh, <laughs> first, I'd like to introduce Michael Gemtrud. He is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Architecture. Michael is the founding director uh, of the Facility for Architectural Research in Media and Mediation, and an Emeritus Faculty Fellow in the Institute for the Public Life of Arts and Ideas. He is interested in how the built environment can enhance and create community. I would like to learn a lot from you, Professor, because you saw when I came in earlier tonight, it was Rose, and we were all back here, and I thought, this is just, just the kind of classroom that that I think makes it very, very challenging to connect. So uh, I hope you'll give us lots of pointers. So Karina and Jessica wrote to me. His work, <laughs> well, I think it means more that you know that this isn't coming from me. This is coming from them and also reflecting other students that, of their classmates that they spoke to. It was a very stiff competition to get on this panel. <laughs> so Karina and Jessica. His work and research on the shifting role of architecture, especially with regard to media and nature, is very interesting. He was also highly recommended by Professor Stephanie Postumus, who is one of our panelists. Moving, uh, coming along this way, Lisa Trimble. Lisa is faculty lecturer in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education. Professor Trimble's research interests include community-based education, inquiry-based learning, and social justice equity in education, as well as anti-oppressive education and emotionality in teaching and learning, especially developing shame resilience. Karina and Jessica. Professor Trimble was recommended by Jeremy Monk who was with us in INTD 497, I knew that, and who is passionate about the power of education to build community. Jeremy is also my co-author on a recent Huffington Post piece about what we call the Caring Classroom. I'm very, very proud to have co-authored a piece with you, Jeremy. Ken Reagan, professor of physics in the Faculty of Science. That's all I have, except, <laughs> except Jessica and Karina have more. Professor Reagan is known for making introductory lectures entertaining and engaging for incorporating demos. He really cares about his students and helps them get the most out of their experience. On the first day, he likes to ask his students four things. What is your background in physics? Summarize your feelings on taking this course. What does physics mean to you? And what can I do to make the course go better? He takes these answers to heart, and it is evident in the way he structures his course. Tina Piper, associate professor in the Faculty of Law. Professor Piper teaches and researches in the areas of intellectual property law and legal history. Jessica and Karina say, she takes a thinking small approach to teaching. She believes that the geography of the classroom is very important in engaging students. And she prefers strategies for assessment that connects students to experiences outside the university setting. Professor Piper sees learning as a social experience. And our fifth panelist, Professor Posthumus, focuses her research on the representations of the non-human or more than human in contemporary French literature as well as across 
European literatures and cultures. And I bet you're waiting to hear what Karina and Jessica say. We chose her because all of the classes she teaches are interdisciplinary. And she is always trying to move away from the standard formulaic paper as an assessment method. For my, Jess's, liberal arts class, she is asking us for a final project instead of a paper that can be in any medium. It might be interesting to ask her a question <laughs> about how the, well, I, this is co-creation. <laughs> about how, how, the, how her course on post-human thinking relates to community building. I thought that was really great, Jess, because, because it's, these are my students thinking about social connectedness wherever they go. I, um, I uh, am now going to give, uh, to give each uh, of you a, a question, and it's, please take this as very open-ended. And uh, what I'd like to do is just to ask you to share about maybe a few minutes each. Whatever you would like to share as educators, uh, also just as, as, as individuals navigating a university campus yourself and, and where does teaching become what you always wanted and hoped it would be and where there might be challenges because clearly not all of the professors uh, at university and other universities, I should say, not only here, find find this seamless. Um, I know it, at this at this uh, at this great um, this great university, it's I think it's uh, six years and ten year track, and I, uh, I I think for you know for, for teaching undergrads, I don't know that there's much incentive about the teaching, uh, but I uh, I'm no means by no means the expert. All of you are, so here it is. What does community mean to you? in your life, in your own life? And how do you bring these values into your classroom and your teaching? I guess community to me is a word like, or other words I deal with like sustainability and public space and things like that where they're, they're always being defined. So they're always in motion. So you always have to be engaging it in a very specific way and thinking about it. And, a diverse way because there's a lot of ways of looking at it and the, the meaning of it's never set. Um, I see we experience that in doing architectural projects all the time because the community is normally represented in a very specific way, um, but once you start to scratch the surface, it's not usually true um, or it's only partially true. I think in the work that, I mean, I feel so spoiled uh, to be in architecture. Um, it's such a tight community as a, as a discipline, um, which has its good and bad points. I think that there's a lot of support within it. Um, it's, it's, I always tell my students at the beginning that the people that they find in the room with them at that given time is, are gonna be their colleagues for life because it's a, it's a pretty tough discipline. It goes up and down a lot. So when you're looking for work, um, these are the people you'll go to first. So I think that develops sort of naturally Plus, they're in the same room for 24-7, and that's a stressful thing, but it's also a kind of beautiful thing. Um, it develops a certain type of intimacy. That, the bad part is that I think that it becomes very incestuous, and we don't get out enough <laughs> with the, the rest of the university. So when people like Stephanie invite me into her class or seminars like this, it's, I feel really privileged. Um, so, uh, you know, that community it, within the classroom already has, it's, it's pretty known for us. We don't have really, it's very small. We don't have like 300 person classes. I happen to teach one of the few courses in architecture that's open to the rest of the university, which is called sustainable design. It's my favorite course because it is interdisciplinary. Um, the projects that we do in studio as well as in those courses are project based. So you were talking about uh, Stephanie asking you to do a, express yourself any way you want to. Well, the projects we tend to work on are um, urban or architectural built world related. So that typically involves policymakers, uh, finance people, management people. It's, it's inherently it gathers all these different disciplines. So. The project-based activity is our privilege because I think it allows us to then work with a lot of different people in the university committee, and that's a community. 
committee. That's actually a burden to teaching well as committees, but um, uh, which I noticed that you put in your brief earlier. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that for now, and we'll see what everybody else has to say. Uh, I'm really happy to be here too. One of the the definitions that I've really loved about learning in community was something offered by Lisa Goldstein, who is also a teacher educator like myself. And she talks about learning in community as being valued, supported, challenged and encouraged, and doing the same for others. Having a safe space to ask questions and to take the risk of answering questions, knowing each other well, and being known and respected by them in return. To me, that's a really beautiful definition of what community in a classroom can be. And it can be hard to achieve when you're teaching with classes of 100 or more, but one of the ways that we can do that as professors is, yes, by trying to know our, our students' names and getting a sense of their story and who they are, but also when we're giving feedback on assignments addressing them personally by name, talking about what we can see that they've done to, to really integrate their time and their energy and their thoughts into things, and where they maybe need a little bit of correcting as well, but by giving meaningful and authentic feedback on their work and giving students lots of opportunities, low-stake opportunities to try out ideas, because this is a place of ideas, isn't it? This is where we can try on new things and get excited about that. And so when we're all feeling like we're, we're working towards something, something bigger than us, together, collectively, and that we're all invested in each other's well-being and success. For me, that's what the definition of community in a university context is. The question was, and I'll put in my own words, what community means and how that um, informs or might inform my teaching. And so I think I need to preface this by saying um, that I feel like a fish out of water here. Okay, um, This is not my language, and this is not my um, approach. If you had asked me before I got Karina's email about connectedness in my classroom, I would have said, you know, go over to the art side of, of, the, uh, of the university. I teach physics, okay? Um, and that's, you know, it, it, as I say, uh, things like building community, improving social connectedness, a sense of belonging, these are not things that I have, the words that have ever crossed my lips in one of my courses. They have never appeared in my syllabus, ever. They will never appear in my syllabus. Um, so, so that's the preface. So let me come back to the question now. The question is about community. So, you know, community is like that, that famous Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court judge quote, I think, that said, uh, you know, I can't define community. He wasn't talking about community, but I can't define community, but I can certainly know one when I see one. So, you know, I think we all understand intuitively what a community is, and we all obviously participate in many communities. There's a university community, there's, you know, a geographic community. In my particular case, there's my, and I think for all of us, there's probably a disciplinary community. I feel very strongly that I'm a physicist. I sit around a lunch table with a bunch of physicists, and we bind, we, we, we bond, we don't bind, we bond, excuse me. Sorry, you gotta, you gotta get your verbs right in English. Okay, we bond, um, because we have uh, a way of looking at the world uh, that is, has been beaten into us, or, or you know, somehow we have, uh, we have acquired, uh, that uh, it, it's, it's by no means unique, but it, is, uh, but it is, is quite different from potential other ways of looking at the world. So, so those are all communities that I participate in, and, and we all participate in many communities. Now, you know, how does that affect my teaching? Well, again, if you'd asked me a week ago about communities, I would have said it doesn't. But now that you mention it, one of the things that I'm trying to do in my courses, and the courses that Karina and, uh, and others have talked about here are largely freshman courses, they're freshman physics, um, and they are, uh, I have a captive audience in the sense that they're not going anywhere because this is a required course, okay? <laughs> Look, let's, you know, I'm honest enough to admit that if I asked them, if I just, you know, handed out cards that said, here, free pass to get an A, you know, would you like to walk out the door? I would lose 90% of my students on the first day. They, they'd just be gone. They, they're not interested in learning physics. They're interested in the fact that it's a required course for a program that they're in or, or for something that they want to do in the future. 
Nonetheless, what I really would like them to come out of that course with, or those courses, is a sense of that, a little bit of a sense of being a scientist, or a, a physicist, ideally, but perhaps a scientist is good enough. That is, that there's a rational way to look at the world, that once you have a world view, in this particular case about the way things move or interact with one another, that can inform the way you look at a lot of things, and in fact, that can be very, very useful in your way of looking at the world. So, that's the community that I'm trying to show them exists, whether or not they will participate in that community, become members of that community is not entirely within my control, but that's certainly uh, one of the communities that I want them to be. And of course, another community, obviously, is the community of my classroom. There they are, they're all in this shared experience. And of course, one of the things that makes a community, one of the things that can make a community, is a very shared, intense experience. So, you know, any natural disaster tends to have a bunch of people that have shared that experience and they have bonded over it. I notice I did use the right verb that time. Um, and for many of my students, I suspect that my physics courses, you know, fulfill that role. They, they, they bond over a very intense, sometimes traumatic, I hope not, you know, intensely traumatic, but uh, it, it's a difficult course. I, I don't make any bones about that. There's, there's no way to finesse. Uh, it about it not being a difficult course. It is going to be a difficult course. I tell them on the first day, this is like drinking from a tsunami, okay? It's gonna come at you thick and fast, you're gonna work hard, I'm not gonna make excuses, and you're not gonna make excuses, you're gonna do the work. Um, that can lead to a shared sense of community. I, I believe it does, as a matter of fact. I, I'm not uh, somebody who, uh, I'm not on Facebook. There's, there, there's my you know, admission. I'm aware that a community develops. Uh, I, that's fine, that's great. Uh, I do what I can to encourage that. I think that it's, it, it, it can be very helpful to students. That's not my goal, but I, I, I concede that it can help the students dramatically, and so, you know, great, that's fantastic. Um, to the extent that I actually, you know, foment that, I'm not sure, and that's what makes me a little bit of a fish out of water, which is the way I started, so I'm gonna pass it on. Thank you. I guess my, my definition or idea of community kind of builds from, from the previous speakers and has sort of elements of, of, of everything you've said. Um, I teach in the law faculty, and part of the, the thing that happens in law is that people come into law looking to understand what it will mean perhaps to become a legal professional. So as a professional faculty, I think we have a really um, distinct role in sort of performing community and, and, um, and introducing students into this community. Um, but for many students, and I know that the, the work of lawyering is, is troubling, um, or the, um, the sort of stereotyped idea of what the work of law is is troubling, and so that community might not be one, in fact, that they want to be a part of, and part of the work in the law faculty is, is teasing out all the different aspects of what that community looks like, and, and the community that you can decide to become a part of or not become a part of, so you don't have to become a corporate lawyer, you can become um, any type of lawyer that meets, that that works in the law. Um, but to do that, I think we have to foster, and, and this has been um, sort of my practice, I guess, has been to foster really authentic communities within the classroom that allow students to try on different identities and to take risks. Even in, I mean, I teach property law, and students find a lot of the um, doctrines of property law really um, like kind of creepy capitalism, you know, <laughs> um, particularly these millennials. <laughs> and, um, and so it's about kind of helping understand how power like reproduces itself and, 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 um, and creates laws and then your role as either um, um, sort of de deliverer or explainer of this or as um, a protester or a antagonist of this regime. And so, so much of creating community in the law faculty is about sort of bridging all of these divides and trying to, and trying to create, I guess, safe spaces for students to act out a whole bunch of different roles and understand eventually what they might want to do when, when they leave the law faculty. Yeah, actually, can I just say ditto? Because you could put literature there where you said law on multiple occasions. But no, uh, first I wanted to thank Jessica. 
for inviting me to this event, in large part because I hadn't thought about my classroom as a community space. I had very much thought about the university, and then you make a bridge to the community that's outside the university. And so it was a nice kind of invitation to sit and reflect on how um, my classroom is a community. And now I'm actually going to take it in a slightly different direction because I wanted to talk about compassion. And um, so thinking about that word is with passion, and you spoke of passion a couple of times in, in your introduction. And so bringing passion into the classroom and what I'm most passionate about. And as a literary scholar, it is I am most passionate about some kinds of literary texts. And so I thought I will take this moment to read just a short piece from my favorite author right now, Yoko Tawada. And the title of her book is Memoirs of a Polar Bear. And so it's written from a polar bear's perspective. So anticipating right climate change, there will no, no longer be polar bears. Um, so one of the things I do in the classroom is talk about climate change and how literature can respond to the kinds of anxiety we have around the possible futures, right? And I also talk a lot about animals. And so this is written from the perspective of a polar bear. And I wanted to infuse a little more humor, but Ken's been doing that. So, but I thought this is, this is kind of a great, very funny little piece from the perspective of a polar bear. And it allows me to kind of point to bringing the non-human world into that community, that classroom community. So panel discussions are like rabbits. Usually what happens during such a session is that further sessions are declared necessary. And if nothing is done to prevent this, they multiply so quickly and become so numerous that it is no longer possible to provide a sufficient number of participants, even if we all devote most of each day to these sessions. We've got to think of a way to end this proliferation of panel discussions. This is a polar bear speaking, who's just been invited to um, contribute to a panel discussion on climate change. Otherwise, our bottoms will be squashed flat from all this sitting, and all our organizations and institutions will collapse beneath the weight of our derrieres. There are ever larger contingents of people who use their heads primarily to think up plausible excuses for why they can't possibly show up for the next panel discussion. The excuse virus has been spreading faster than a dangerous flu. And then everyone's real and fictitious relatives are all having to die several times over so that their funerals can serve to excuse absences. I have no relatives I can condemn to fictional death. My physical makeup makes me immune to influenzas of every sort, and so I'm left without excuses. Time passed, and I kept getting lost in the pages of my appointment book, which had been attacked by a mildew of obligations." And that's where I will end the reading, but it's a way for me to, again, kind of point a little bit fun at the practices within academia, but how we can address issues of climate change and animal ethics with humor. And I think that's kind of part of, yeah, the passion I bring to the classroom. Thank you all very much. You know, in each of your remarks, whether intentionally or just because that's how, how you roll. Uh, you've, uh, I think, given us some I think, very good keys about the value of creating community in, uh, in a university setting. I'd like to just uh, ask, and there's no, we won't, not all five people have to respond, but I just maybe, uh, I'll try to have an equitable balance of, but, but I wanted to ask uh, anyone who cared to take it, what are some of the challenges to building community? At the law faculty, I know, I mean, the big one that jumps out for me is just the physical, and I, you said it in my introduction, but I just need to put it out there again, it's just the physical geography of the classroom. Um, and just the, um, and, and I guess we saw it in this room as well, but when, one of the biggest barriers for me has always been having those rows of fixed seats um, with students sitting in fixed chairs, staring at the front of the room. And I guess because I taught my property law course in an active learning classroom, um, I first taught it in a lecture hall and then in an, in, a, in an active learning classroom where the tables were all round and there was no, there was only a center to the room, but there was no, um, there was no front. 
And, and then I went back to the lecture room and took all the stuff that I'd been doing in the active learning classroom back into a lecture room. And it was really remarkable to me just, just observing the change in quality of the relation. I, there was nothing that changed except the classroom geography and the quality, like just observing the deterioration in the quality of the relationships between students and the way that my role as a professor changed, became more of a, uh, I definitely felt like I became more of a, of a of a, of a custodian, like I, I felt more like I was expected to be more of an like a like an authority, but not exactly a, co a facilitator, which is was the role that I'd played in the active learning classroom. It was really evident to me, and I also saw students saying things to each other in the classroom, in the lecture seating room, that they wouldn't have said to each other face to face in the active learning classroom, or that it would have been processed really differently. So conflict ha happened much more differently in the just in in the different rooms and the geographies of the different rooms, and it was just so striking to me that just like a simple change like like round tables um, and no front to the room just made um, an immense difference to the sense of community students felt and how they, they knew each other's names and I knew their names. It wasn't hard to learn their names in, a, in, a, in that classroom. It was all, all sorts of things changed because of that. Your experience, and I'm sure for all of the students, it changes too. M Michael, I, if you, I'm going to just pivot uh, off, off this because we're talking about the, the, uh, the geography of the classroom. I wondered, you, you may want to, to comment on, on that, but I'm all, I also would ask you might, uh, if you would consider to broaden, to look at how does the physical geography of the university impact community building? Uh, an example would be having to uh, walk, I was told, please don't have your classroom up the hill because no one will go. Um, this, <laughs> this university has two campuses, uh, the, the word classroom I'm using intentionally, and being a teacher I'm using intentionally because that's what resonates with me. Uh, but is, are, is, does it resonate? Uh, is it intentional? I look, one of your uh, many, now this year, we're, is, 2017 is 50 years since one of your, uh, I, guess it, I guess it was his, his uh, Moshe Safdie, it was his, it was his uh, undergraduate paper, wasn't it? Not thesis, not, not grad school that, that, uh, that led to the, um, the uh, habitat. habitat, yeah. And, uh, and I actually have a, have a goal, uh, if anyone, maybe it's, we could do it together with your, uh, with your department is to bring him here this year because it is the 50th year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, I think it would be wonderful to look at why, and this may not be the way to it, what, what, why, didn't, why didn't Habitat uh, go on to, to build the name, so to build, to build community, but, but actually focus about all the different ways that architecture can either build community or not build community. But let's, since we're here at this university, can you let us know how it looks from an architectural point of view, not lovely buildings or maybe not so lovely buildings in classrooms, but in terms of connectivity and, and, and what, could, what, what could maybe make it stronger? We're pretty privileged with the campus we do have because there are, uh, there are good spaces around. I think we have a bit of a, I mean, what is our deferred maintenance budget is 1.3 billion now, I think. It went, it, it went over the b billion mark for sure. So yeah, it matters. And I think the university has tried to make strides with the resources it has to try to create some spaces that can be shared. And I know like my daughter goes to Concordia, but she studies at the McGill Library all the time because it's, Concordia's got also challenges being a real urban campus um, and they deal with it in a different way. So there's, I don't think there's any one solution to it. Um, I know from, from my own experience, the. In, in architecture, the facilities we have are uh, don't necessarily foster the kind of community that other places, other schools do that have purpose-built sort of buildings. So I do think that's something we have to work harder on. And the you know, there's a lot of talk around the Royal Victoria Hospital as our next big swing space, and um, I've seen a lot of different. Uh, proposals for that. And actually, we're going to be running a master's design studio on crazy ideas for the RVH instead of the kind of just space planning exercises that we've gone through so far. So 
I think we're getting there. I think that I think the university recognizes it. I think there has been some the library. I mean, I was here for that renovation. That was significant. That that really helped. I think a lot. Um, of course, the social media spaces, or in some cases, anti-social media spaces, are transforming that as well. Um, I think there's a big difference too between the gates that we have out here that, that the community has a hard time crossing to come to see us is, a, is an issue, uh, architecturally speaking, uh, that Concordia doesn't necessarily have, like the, the, the newer buildings they have down there. They intentionally designed the, the first floor of the, um, oh God, what's it called? The EV building um, to be a public space. It was a requirement of the city, so, you know, the, the, it, there's a lot of different movement through there than here. And so I think there's two different issues there. There's the learning community and there's the community, how we as a very privileged group of people in this room in, in the higher education connect with the rest of the community, uh, the Montreal community, the global community. And that, that's a, there's two different spaces to that is what I'm trying to say. If I could, I'll bring Lisa into this uh, now. Uh, and, and with regard to uh, a different kind of architecture, although they very much relate, I believe, which is the architecture of relationships and the architecture of learning. And for example, social and emotional learning, um, but, which we read a great deal about uh, in younger years, not so much in university, or whether it's called school climate or I call the respect, recognition, reciprocity. But I'm wondering uh, if you could maybe comment and, and, and then I could ask the three other panelists to jump in as you'd like. Uh, and then I think I might take it, take it, to, the, take it to the floor. Um, with, uh, with, with the relationships between different faculties, uh, are there silos in universities? that might go at cross purposes to, to connecting. Because for me, it's, it's that what we're talking about, it's a university and it's student focused, student in, in a holistic sense. But, but I don't believe that you can really build community for students if you're not doing that with <coughs> professors and with custodial workers and with administration all, you know, all together. This is, our, this is our, our sharp land. So I wondered if you might, might like to pick it up there. I think that institutions, just by the very nature of institutions, tend to put things in place that make it easiest for the institution to function and navigate. And that sometimes gets in the way of, you know, like, if we tell students that they can't hand anything in after midnight, and that all is lost at 12.01 or 12.02, um, then we're not, we're not creating a dynamic where we're we're defining student success in terms of learning uh, and, and responding to students' lives. I had a, a student once tell me that her mother was in a really bad car accident just, just at the end of term. So she sent a, an email to all of her professors asking for an extension because her mother had been in this terrible car accident. And she didn't hear back from any of her professors. And there's very little space for real life and humanness in the way that our academic institutions are defined. And, and that's a problem, because when we only are able to define student success in terms of how high the grade is, as opposed to the depth and content and transformative potential of their learning, we've, we've really created a very narrow space, and that's enormously anxiety producing for a lot of students. I got an 85, I got an A, why did I not get a 90? Why did I not get a 98? And, and the institution itself, I think, creates barriers for us to build community and, and we're discouraged from it in a lot of ways. And I think that there are a lot of people who are trying to transform that and who are really trying to, um, to connect with ideas and students and one another and other faculty members. But you're right, it's the emotionality of learning that can sometimes get in the way of, of building community. And, and uh, I'm excited when I see people trying to change that because that's when the really interesting, meaningful stuff happens, when we can kind of engage with this and what this means to us as an individual and as a community and, and as a university. Would any of you like to add to this? Yeah, take up the idea of how at the primary and secondary school level, learners 
are very much seen as having minds and bodies, and then they get to the university and it's like we treat often students as disembodied minds, right? The problem of academics is that we just want to engage with their mind when they come into the classroom. And so how can we move away from that model of a disembodied kind of mind engagement? And I think that's what we're trying to talk talk about is that that how our bodies just like bringing the mind back into a body is a way of trying to recognize that we're in proximity with bodies right and that that creates a sense of intimacy and we have to be addressing that too right so um trying to make those spaces where yeah the, just the story about uh, the, the stories behind students are what allow us to kind of bring the bodies into the classroom, right? So if a mother's been in a car accident or... And granting extensions, I think they're just... I was at the... Lucy sitting over there from the Student Affairs Office and I was at a mental health yeah, workshop for our advisors and how there still is this very strong discourse around not lowering academic standards. And again, the, the problem of that kind of disembodied intellectual mind that just kind of always hovers in the background, right? That, that, that's what McGill is. It's, that, it's the mind, the intellect, right? I really appreciate you saying that. I, 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 I think that the disembodied mind, not that I'm advocating on behalf of disembodied minds, but even looking at students that way or looking at intellect that way, it, it seems to me that when any of us are supported, when we feel that someone believes in us, that we're not there because somebody's waiting for us to fail, but rather to see us succeed, when we're in a safe space, it doesn't have to be less challenging. It doesn't have, I, I kept hearing, I mean, we're research, it's a research uh, university. Okay, okay, but that doesn't mean that it can't be great at, at teaching, which is not to say it isn't, but, but maybe if it is, that should be emphasized, right? I would like to see, you know, McLean's Magazine does every year this, this ranking of, of Canadian universities. And, uh, and I've, I've, I'm combing comb through all that. And I, there's nothing about this. You know, there's nothing about, it, wouldn't, it, it might be phrased differently, but about the... But what's the teaching? The quality of the teaching experience. Do and we, what? What? What's the experience for students coming to that university? Are they generally happy? Do they generally stay? What's that? Because I think all of that is really important. And then when you go on to whatever, many of my students, many McGill students are now are going to go on to grad grad school. Uh, I think it's the same premise there. But then after that, or, or those that are going right into, uh, into work or to do fabulous things with NGOs, and now, I, I mean, it's, it's going to be what you take with you, those kinds of what Amart Marty has sent of agency. It's, it's your agency. It's, it's your ability to get around, to navigate for yourself, to be a good person, to be a kind person, and to be caring for others. And, and if, that's, if that's what's being modeled in the classroom, then I think that there's a way better chance of that being modeled outside the classroom along with, and I would believe probably goes in hand, hand in hand with, someone needs to research this, but, but, but even better academic experience um, might be something interesting to look at. What I think I'd like to do is to broaden this to the room. And I wanted to uh, make a comment, as I mentioned about my, my students, there's other students here, so thank you all, students, for coming. I'm kind of close to mine because uh, my first ever students, they're awesome, but also they really helped me to build community here. But so did uh, a couple of, um, of professors. One, he's, he's not here tonight, but is uh, Phil Oxhorn, uh, who uh, was uh, head of ISID, is now an associate provost, and uh, gave me a, a great deal of support in coming. Um, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, Rachel Cadell Monroe, who's here with us, who is an incredible, uh, has an incredible story, so much to learn. And if, if, if I didn't want to learn so much from you, I might feel jealous because uh, your, uh, your students, um, several of whom in this are in this room, actually rave, rave about you and want to go do field re research. And I think that, uh, I think that Rachel is, uh, 
is a great uh, model of what professors of practice are. Uh, if we take away the professor, professor part, uh, um, I think that there's there is room and, and support for everyone. And so I just want to say I can't wait to see when you're uh, when you have your own course to teach, and I hope it's very soon. And uh, I also wanted to uh, welcome Adele Black. Adele similarly has students that uh, that want to be in your as with all of you in your courses and classes, not simply because of the requirement or this is the course material, but because you have them thinking and thinking in terms of what their wider responsibilities are. And I happen to have seen uh, some of the responses and feedback that Adele students have given. So I wanted to say, and it's amazing, thank you for being my mentors and helping me build community. Um, I hope that other, uh, other members of faculty and administration and all the different things that bring us here uh, have, have that same opportunity. So I know it's here. I just think that, uh, that it, it may, uh, there may be room, some room for improvement. Uh, in terms of the, uh, where we go from here, um, I wanted to um, ask uh, if, the, if questions and comments, and they can be comments too, it doesn't have to be questions, if tonight we really just uh, had, uh, had this coming from people that are part of the McGill community that are uh, uh, professors um, uh, in administration and especially students. Uh, because I think that this hasn't happened before and to have this kind of interaction is really valuable and uh, we're all members of this community here tonight, but if you would, wouldn't mind to, uh, to allow me to, re to redesign this a little bit, I think it would be, uh, it would be important. At the end of our course, we did a town hall, and I know that a lot of my students have so much to say about this, so I would say here's a really good chance to tell a compassionate, caring room things that you would want to pass on to, uh, to next year's uh, freshmen, and I think it would also be a great opportunity for professors to share what you would advise uh, young uh, professors, new professors coming in. So is there a first question or comment? Hi, I'm Angela. I was a student in uh, both international development and psychology here at McGill. I was in Professor Samuel's class. Um, so I really enjoyed Professor Reagan's comment earlier about how if students were given a free pass to, take, to not take his course, he thinks 90% of them would, would, would take the pass. And I was thinking about um, my um, time here at McGill and the classes I've taken, and I think if I had been given a free pass to all of them, I probably would have taken them for 90% of the classes I've taken. And um, of course, except for Professor Samuel's class. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and for other cool courses like cognitive anthropology with um, Professor Samuel Basir, who's here with me tonight. And um, this is not to say that I don't value my um, experience or my education here at McGill, but that too often um, classes are places where I feel that students are being lectured at and um, students are pitted against each other for um, because like only so many students can make it into grad school and med school and law school and you know and because of things like grade curving, um, we're all kind of going after the A and. Um, uh, so coming from a science background, I see um, a lot of competition over community. And um, I've seen students like purposely give each other wrong answers on, during study sessions. I have, uh, most of my peers are ashamed if they get an 83% on an exam. And um, I think that after a while, a lot of us develop this kind of mindset that um, learning and doing well in a classroom is a zero-sum game, and, which is simply not true. So my question is, um, do you think, and this is open, um, do you think the university community creates at times unhealthy competition between students? And what can professors and students do to strike a balance between healthy competition and community? The short answer is yes. Uh, your question was, uh, can there be situations where there's unhealthy competition? Almost certainly. That's that's not something we encourage, I don't think. I don't think, but, but it's certain that we abet it in certain cases. Um, I'd like to address a few of your specific points. Um, one of them is this idea that there's unhealthy competition because there's only, say, so many slots, or, I mean, that, that's, that's a true fact. There's only so many slots in med school, and in fact, if you're at McGill and you want to go to McGill and med school, you'd be better off leaving because the number of spots at McGill Med School for McGill undergraduates is to first order zero. 
Um, there are more spots for out-of-province students than here. Any, anyways, that, that's an aside. But, but bringing it back to a course level, um, people, I mean, instructors, teachers can, can do things to, to try to alleviate that. For instance, one of the things I tell my students is that if they all ace the exams, they will all get A's. I have absolutely no shame in going to my faculty and saying, my Physics 101 class, 45% of them earned an A. I get pushed back on it from the faculty every single year, and every single year I tell them, my kids are good, they worked hard, they worked to the, you know, they learned the material, they did well. I have absolutely no problem. Now, there are faculties, there are indiv individual instructors, there are courses in which there is a curve and only X percent will get an A or an A minus or whatever it is. I personally find that, um, somewhat uh, disagreeable, to, for lack of a better word. Uh, that, to me, smacks of an arbitrariness that means that your result is inherently dependent on the cohort you are with. You have to be a moderately strong student, but in an incredibly weak cohort, you will get the A. You happen to be that, in, that same moderately strong student in a very strong cohort, you will get a B. That, to me, is, is far too arbitrary. So. Uh, all grading to first order is our, has, a, has an element of arbitrariness. Don't quote me on that, but it's a fact of life. Um, and, and so I think intelligent use of things like curves can help to alleviate that. Uh, in my courses, um, you know, is there unhealthy competition? Well, Angela, were you in my course? I don't know. No, no okay, so, so some people here were, I, I think, I suspect. Do you, can I have a show of hands? Who's been in a course of mine? Okay, so a few people at least. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you if the perception in my own courses is one of unhealthy competition. There's no question that uh, I l allow. In fact, I even encourage uh, people to work together on some of the uh, on some of the assignments. Uh, of course, they know, however, that they're going to go into a midterm or a final exam, and they're going to be on their own. So the group work. Uh, I mean, all of the pedagogic research shows that peer instruction and group work can be used positively to encourage learning and to, and to further learning. Um, but that being said, there can be situations where there is uh, an, an amount of unhealthy competition. It, it's, a, it's an academically intense university. There's, there's no doubt about that. I don't see, I'll, I'll admit here that I, I, I don't see quite how to square that circle, to take out the competition element and remain with an element that still has academic standards, that still has uh, strives for academic excellence, and that still uh, strives to have students that are really pushing their own limits. The competition thing in architecture is pretty intense. Um, we, we, we literally have competitions every term between students. I mean, we, it's, it's like a blood fest sometimes. But um, I don't think it's a bad thing either necessarily, but it I see my role as a professor to monitor it very closely and to, you know, be kind of a referee in some sense, but also just be very cognizant of the consequences of it and as, to keep it healthy, basically. Um, but I'm not, I can't stand grading. If I could change it all to pass fail, I would. Um, I, I think that there's different ways of evaluating success that has nothing to do with grades. I, I really have a problem with them. And we've experienced the grade inflation to the point where, frankly, I think it's quite meaningless um, in this, I don't know about the rest of the university, but in architecture for sure. So I, again, I think it's an important reality of life and that it's, it's a, uh, it's part of the socialization process. I mean, I've seen students destroy other students' models, you know, that's crossing a line. Giving you a wrong answer, not cool, but it's not necessarily, you know, gonna kill you. But um, it, it's definitely, that's just one though, I think of many situations within the classroom that you have to be aware of as a professor and to understand that there's a lot of baggage that gets brought into these things and there's a lot of different reasons for it. And some of it isn't intentional, some of it's uh, just because you're really, really tired. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't want to just say that's bad and this is good, but it, it's a fact. Yeah, I had two comments. I mean, I feel like one aspect of competition is sort of feed on what you were saying, is this idea that 
competition that's freely chosen, I think, can be really healthy. And so I've seen students really achieve their potential in courses where they're doing group projects and the projects are competing and they really find their voice and there's something about the competition that motivates them. But I think in the law school, we do have a form of, of curving or gra grading within ranges. And I know that that, where students feel like they don't have any control over it, I feel like it's that lack of control and that feeling like something's being done to them and they're being, things are being shaped outside of their control that's really leads to kind of powerless behaviors and, and, and um, perhaps un unhealthy moments. Um, I'd also like to say, like, part of what comes to me when we talk about this is the sort of the metaphors and the, the ways that we think about the university and what the university is doing, and some of the metaphors around sort of um, students as, as um, I don't know, sort of industrial units moving through this sort of assembly line, and there's this idea of progress where you move from one degree to another degree and eventually to a career, and these sort of like linear models of production, it feels like we're all sort of engaged in this like big enterprise um, that feels a bit like a factory. And I feel like breaking down some of those metaphors and ways of thinking about the university are really healthy because I see when my students come to law school, a number of them are like, well, I'm in law school now and I'm going to become a lawyer. And that's the next step on this sort of like, on this assembly line, but who am I? I'm completely lost. And, and the competition can sometimes, or the competitiveness can sometimes stem from this loss of identity and, and like, a, a, like the energy sometimes gets focused on this, you know, on these weird social dynamics and, and yeah, so I'll just sort of put that out there. Hi, um, my name's Maddie. I was also in Professor Samuel's class. Um, and just before I ask my question, I actually, in the vein of thanking professors, I'm also about to graduate. And, I've never actually met Professor Kittle Monroe, but um, I took your 200 level uh, international development class in my first year. My um, major was religion back then. Um, and your kind of engagement, just like a lot of other professors with your field work and, and the passion you had and also just your ability to call out the university experience for what it was um, made me decide to go into international development. So I'm so happy that you are here today. Um, but I did just want to open this question to you, but also to the panelists, um, and it kind of has to do with competition and assessment as well, is um, kind of the balance of workload and, and learning. Um, I spent a semester at Trinity College in Dublin, and for all the classes I had, we had one essay at the end of the semester, and um, I met students from universities all over, and none of them had the workload that um, McGill has in terms of the number of assignments um, and tests and things like that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on, on what you see as the role um, or the balance between workload um, and maintaining, like you've all said, that academic standard um, and making sure that you're, you know, uh, that the students are engaging with the material, but then also um, kind of a, a real deeper understanding, not just, you know, quizzes every week or, or whatever it may be for the grades. Um, so I just did want to kind of get your opinions on, on that balance? I think that community is intentionality um, and that when you're building community, it's, it's something that we're doing purposefully and mindfully. And I think that in, our, in, in the workload, there have to be opportunities that are about the learning and not about the grade. And it's, it's difficult to build in to these kinds of things. When I, hear students, when I hear stories of students destroying each other's work or giving each other the wrong answers, uh, that makes me sad. And I think that as university professors, we can name that. And we can say that this is something that goes on in our faculties. And that, uh, that connecting with other people that we like and trust is an essential part of that. When you're talking about workload, I think we have to listen to our students. And I think we have to have some flexibility if students are saying, it's too much, or I haven't learned enough yet to fully do this well, or I'm at the point of needing to drop out because I can't handle the workload. Then I think that we have to be able to respond to that. Because I think any good community is only as solid as its ability to support its members. Um, and I think that that means really putting our, our money where our mouths are in this. And it means that students have to trust us enough to come and talk with us about that. 
and it means that professors have to be able to listen and then come back to the class because we can't, it's difficult for us to make changes in our assessment strategies unless the class agrees on it. Like we have to come, if it's in the syllabus, we have to come back and discuss with the class and get the class to agree to a, a different assessment strategy. But I think listening is a really big part of that. And I think uh, it's on us to establish the fact that, that you can trust us and that you're not going to be harmed if you're saying it's too much. And I think that's something we need to work on. I think that's a really important question. I just wanted to say as well that what you said about the way we treat our students, I think also has to mirror how the university treats professors. Just to put that out there. <laughs> that um, in terms of respecting workload and li being listened to, and, and when you say it's too much, when you have family commitments, or when you have other things going on in your life, I think we can only bring, professors can only bring as much to the table as they have, like if we can't keep our own home fires burning, like we can't keep our like empathy alive in our own personal relationships and our families, um, in the life that we have outside of the university, it's virtually impossible for us to be empathetic with our students in the classroom. And so I think there's a bigger discussion that needs to happen around workload at the university as a whole, and what is an appropriate workload, and what we expect of professors, and 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 what it is you know, what, what, a, what a whole professor looks like, because I think that's what a whole student can end up looking like, too. So. Yeah, maybe I was just going to come back to the point about um, the flexibility, right? And if we're getting the kind of rigidity from the administration, it's really hard to make those accommodations for students. And this really came home to me when my partner has been exploring reasonable accommodations for next semester, and basically no one at the McGill administration, except one person in human resources, has been able to address some of his questions about how to teach with reasonable accommodations. And for me, this really echoes how, um, yeah, if we're trying to put in place different kinds of structures for professors to be more flexible, right, and kind of sets of reasonable, like, accommodations, it has to be at the administrative level as well. But yeah, I think the response, not kind of generally about workload and learning is, is it's, it's for me very much a case by case basis and really encouraging students, trying to be as open as possible, open door policy. The number of colleagues I have who have office hours with their doors closed really confuses me, but yeah, um, so just encouraging that yeah, to come into that space. And the number of students, too, who say, I've never dared go into my professor's office, right? So. Hi, um, my name's Nora. Um, I'm an English major and a geography minor. And uh, this question might be adding a little level of complexity to the discussion, but uh, in a major where I would say about 90% of the students are female, um, most of my classes, the people who participate the most are men, and uh, which I feel like a lot of the people in this room could probably testify to. Um, but uh, I was just wondering how this kind of speaks to an even larger issue of uh, in classrooms when only one or two students participate. Um, and how you as professors kind of navigate that and try to uplift students who may feel uncomfortable or may feel like their uh, input isn't valued. Um, yeah. I think this is a really great question that touches on uh, a number of different things. Um, and, and I think it, it may look, from your perspective as a student, like a minefield. It's no less of a minefield uh, from a professor's perspective. I have a class of 700. I ask them for input. I ask for questions. We have clicker questions. We have a lot of discussion. But it can happen, it does happen, that a few voices, uh, very confident students, sometimes women, sometimes men, uh, will tend to respond quickly to many of my you know, posed questions. I ask a question. Somebody shouts it out from the third row. I ask another one. Same person. Same person. So. Um, that's great. This person you know, is clearly engaged, is clearly listening, is clearly thinking about the material. Uh, but I have to navigate that to try to be more inclusive. And uh, I, have, I, I try to do that. 
but it does involve students' help, you know, plural, students' help. They, other people, need to be able to step up or need to want to step up to the plate to help me through that. It's not that I continually choose that person out of a forest of hands. It's that that person self-selects in some cases. So th there's, the minefield here is that although, you know, if you take a step back and you look statistically, it turns out that only a few percent of the class and it's, you know, a, a recognizable subset of the class in your particular case is participating. Um, you know, is that because they are being actively chosen, in which case this is a really serious problem with the, with the instructor, or because the others are choosing not to be quite so rapid in their responses or quite so loud sometimes in their responses? Um, and there's a whole bunch of literature on this, on, you know, numerous effects of, of people and, and their uh, uh, desire and, and their, their, their self-esteem and their... Um, their self-image as to whether or not they will want to be called upon. And it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult area. So, you know, what can we do as instructors? We can obviously choose to be colorblind, genderblind, everything blind, but we need the opportunity to do that, and that also means people uh, being willing to ask questions, and, and, and certainly, I mean, if I, if I am implicitly or, or very sub, subtly doing something like, um, you know, sh not shaming, I, I don't want to use that word because I really don't think I do, but if I am somehow, you know, uh, projecting an image that I don't want to hear from certain people, I need to be told about that. But I don't believe that that's my case, and yet, I do recognize that certain groups will respond less often, less forcefully, less confidently, and uh, that's, that's actually very, very difficult to combat. And, and all you can do is make people aware that you welcome their interventions, that you welcome their comments, that you welcome their questions, that you welcome uh, their participation. Uh, so, so that's kind of my view in a large class. I, I try to mix it up. It's not always successful. It's very difficult to do. I wondered if I could just ask a question uh, to, to build on that, which is what, what, in what ways can students help? Because, because you are building community together. I have my answers for my, you know, for my class, but it may be different for every, everyone's classes. But what are the kinds of things that you look to students to do? I think for me, it's a question of format. There's no silver bullet here. So, like, I teach seminar courses at the graduate level. I don't have, I don't teach 700 person lecture courses, but I do teach a lecture, studio courses, workshops. So they're all different, and they all require a different um, level of participation. And there's different mechanisms to get students involved in that. I think again, keeping keeping the avenues open and listening for sure, and just paying attention. I think that's the biggest thing. And uh, you can sense those, or at least I feel like I can sense those dynamics. And then, you know, you address it uh, when there's students that you know or You can tell when someone's chomping at the bit to say something, but I'm an introvert myself, so I understand how they just don't come out. So, you know, you just catch them in the hallway or whatever and say, uh, what do you want to say? You know, you got to cultivate that stuff. And again, I don't think I could do that with a 700-person course. But um, in my context, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. And this, those are just skills you develop over time. I think with teaching, and hopefully the students feel comfortable enough to to approach you about that. So, um, my name is Eva Naretsky, and I taught. I mean, not 700-person course, but a 120-person course. And I think one way of encouraging a more balanced approach to answering is having students pair and share. Um, so kind of just removing the onus from immediate response and giving them an opportunity to at least discuss amongst themselves, I do think does work for large classrooms. And then, I mean, and always no pressure, you can always point to a corner of a room, the back, where students may not volunteer responses from, see if that mobilizes students from there to answer. So I think really immediacy is a problem and it really plays to extroverts' strengths um, or the eager student strengths. So taking a few moments and building in questions that can productively be discussed quickly um, amongst the students worked really well, 
I, I would like to thank <laughs> for, for that class. Great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Rachel, and the recipients of far too much praise, because I think there's a lot of amazing teachers in this room. But um, I, I, I've listened really carefully um, to what everyone said, and I, I hear so many echoes in it. I think the first time um, I came into my classroom, I was teaching the INTD 200, and I walked into this room. I had, didn't had no idea. I walked into this room, and it's this massive amphitheater, the Leacock Thing in the Leacock building, and it was full of people with computer screens up, and I stand in front of them, and I'm like, it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying, and you have all these eager faces looking at you, or some not so eager, wondering what you're going to do, and it's just that feeling of, in a way, you feel like a performer, and that's what I always feel like in front of one of those rooms, is that you're putting on a performance. And how can you engage that performance and engage the people the most in it? That is not, for me, really what teaching is about. That's something else. So I think this huge classroom thing is very challenging, and I understand why it happens. Um, but I think it makes it very difficult. I think that it creates very dehumanizing, and I've heard this a few times in this. I think, you know, the university becomes a very dehumanized place, and something that I always wanted to do in the classes that I had the privilege of giving was to try and bring back in that humanity. I'm a humanitarian aid worker, so that's like kind of what I do. Um, and I feel, though, that I was also a student at McGill in 2011 to 2013 as a master's student, and I also felt very much a commodity. Um, and I think this is, you, you mentioned that as well, this idea of these industrial units going through the system. I think students become a commodity, and that's why I think that many students, when they came, and people who came in the classes that I taught, and the feedback they gave me was, you made me understand why I'm here, because I've kind of lost the plot of why I came to university in the first place. And hearing you speak makes me again realize why I want to be here, and that inspiration to be here and to go through all the horrible parts of school in order to be able to get to the place that I want to be, which is, you know, whatever it is, an international development. It's a certain um, uh, direction people want to go. I think this, um, so that's the, that the context of this power. I think we can't forget the, the issue of power inside education, the power, the power balance between teacher and student. And I think we have to get rid of that power. Um, power dynamic that's going on because I actually feel like education is a joint enterprise. I learn as much from people and students I've had the luck to work with as I'm able to give back. And I can only give when I'm able to receive also. So that's part of the communication and the reciprocity. Um, and I think in the end of the day, the tactics that I used in class was very much that I exposed myself. And I talk about me, my experiences, and I always start the course by saying, all I have is my stories. And then what do those stories mean? Those are my stories, but we all have our stories. And every classroom we walk into, we bring our stories, and we need to be able to respect those stories, because that is what we have in our lives. And so I think that um, you know, the passion, the humor, uh, are very important parts of it as well. But in the end of the day, you're dealing with very deep, um, strong, and important issues. And I think I would make my last thing is a uh, sort of a shout out to ISID, I think, because this idea of professors of practice is absolutely brilliant. Because I think it's for me, as a humanitarian aid worker, um, having dabbled in academia, I think that the bridge between the two and the link and the connection between the two is absolutely critical. And you talked about reaching outside of the university community to the, to the rest of the world. Those gates should not be there. And we in our community, we need so much support from the academic community on issues that we're struggling with. And vice versa, the academic community also needs to hear what practitioners are struggling with in order to inform and, and further their own uh, their own uh, research. So um, I'm very sad now that I will not be able to teach anymore because the rules have changed at McGill because of the union. So I'm not al actually allowed to teach anymore at McGill, which is a great sadness. And I know a sadness also for ICID. Um, but it means that that link now between academics and practice has now again been broken, which is a real pity. So thanks. Nora, I, I just quickly wanted to address what you had asked from my perspective, coming back to the idea of, of intentionality um, and expressing what our values are as educators. And so if we have 
a person or a group of people who are monopolizing the conversation. I think that we need to say, I value what you're saying. And I'd like to invite spaces for other people to say things. Um, and, and that also holds us accountable when we're explicit about what our values are and how we're trying to encourage everybody to be part of our community. And so if we're not doing that, we can also tell students, you know, you can tell me if I'm not doing a good job with that because it's important to me that I am. Um, but I think that we don't allow a lot of space for silence. And we ask a question and immediately somebody jumps to an answer. Or if they don't, we tend to fill up the space with our own air because we get nervous and fidgety as professors too. And I think just allowing 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to pass allows people to process their thoughts and to recognize that they can move into that space and that it's okay. And I think that by making eye contact around the room with various people and smiling at them is also an invitation to say you're part of this community. And I want to hear from everybody who wants to say something. And we can come back to something that you talked about a few minutes ago, and that's also okay. Just because we've moved on to something else doesn't mean that you haven't you know, had time to think about this. So I wanted, that, that's one of the ways that I think we can do that, Nora. Thank you. Uh, my name is Delphine, and I'm an exchange student from Paris. So I come from, I'm a law student, by the way, I'm at the law faculty, and um, I come from a university where us, so we have two types of classes. We have actual classes, where we're about 40 in a classroom, and then we have lectures. Our smallest amphitheater seats 300 people. Our biggest amphitheater seats 2,000 people. After a week, you stop going to classes, because when you're sitting right at the back and the professor is the size of your thumb, you do not kind of, you know, you have no interaction with the subject matter, you don't listen to anything, you have a thousand, no, sorry, 2,000 screens in front of you as well because everyone has their computers open, half of them on Facebook, so 1,000 people on Facebook, even more, and it's just impossible to actually follow anything that's being said by the professor. Uh, I've never spoken to any of my professors except one. Um, like, this is the kind of environment I come from, and I'm not, obviously, uh, it's, it's a completely different system, so it's not comparable, but it's just to say I have a different perspective on things, I suppose. And what I discovered at the McGill Law Faculty is that the faculty itself is a community, and that there is a lot going on within the faculty, and what I appreciate the most is the fact that there is so much going on that if you're a student from, coming from a board and you don't know anyone, all you have to do is get a tiny bit involved, go to a club, go to a talk, go to anything really, and immediately there are people to interact with. You can meet so many people and do so many things. That's been my personal experience. And I think what I also appreciate is the fact that professors encourage this and that you find professors at talks and in club activities and professors in class will say, by the way, there's this brilliant talk, or by the way, this club is doing something that kind of, you know, joins with what we said in class, and if you want to get involved, you should, and that is really important, I think, that professors should encourage students to get involved within the wider McGill community, outside of class as well. And my second comment, because that was my first, I have a lot of opinions about many things, which is probably why I'm in law school. <laughs> And my second comment was that I think on the subject of competition that we also need maybe to create a space for ignorance in the classroom in the sense that I always feel a lot more I always feel a lot more legitimate and a lot more like I'm actually in the competition and not the person who's lost before even starting when my I feel like I can like, I feel I'm allowed to not know something, and I feel I'm allowed to ask the question. And I think the way professors react to questions and the way... And even sometimes I remember a class where one professor said to a student, you know, you came to see me during um, my hours, and you asked me a question, I'd like you to repeat that question in front of the class. And it was a fairly basic question, but to be honest, I didn't know the answer either. <laughs> and I was glad that... That professor was encouraging the student to reveal her ignorance, but as something normal, as something that is part of a process of learning. And when you're allowed to be ignorant, you don't feel like you're an outsider. You feel like you're in the competition because everyone around you is also ignorant, and we're all moving 
it's, it's an even playing field, basically. And we're all moving at the same rate, and you know, we all have a chance. Yeah. That, that was, those were my two comments. Thank you very much. I, uh, when you, when you uh, talked about, about, about <coughs> use the word I ignorance, I was thinking, uh, I was thinking it in a different way. It was really more, more about the uh, each person being, being allowed to not know something and to be in an environment where that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's bringing you know what I think what knowledge is supposed to be for. And uh, thank you so much for your excellent comments and everybody's excellent comments. I, I'm going to, um, we've got only about five minutes left. So what I'm going to, to do is, uh, I see Jeremy's been wanting to uh, come in. So Jeremy, I, uh, no pressure, but it better be awesome what you're about to say because <laughs> you will be the last person, Jeremy Monk. Hey, thanks, uh, Professor Samuel. So I'm just kind of wondering, my name is Jeremy. I'm a major in international development and history. I'm also a minor in education. Um, so being in that faculty has really made me think of things maybe a little bit differently than a lot of other art students. Um, so I guess I always like to say like, we're all in university and, and you guys have done your PhDs because I think at the bottom we kind of like school and we kind of like learning and as much as you want to complain right now about work and, and all that stuff that we actually enjoy being here a little bit. Um, a lot of it kind of comes I think from our experience in primary and secondary school. So if there's one thing that I guess I could ask is, um, I presume all of you have gone through primary and secondary school, um, if there's one sort of experience or method that you could take from from you being there and bring it to the university classroom, what would it be? <laughs> Actually, I'd like each panelist to answer that question. Yeah, I, don't re I, I don't remember much of primary or secondary school, but what I do know is my children's experience. And they went to a school, uh, an alternative school in NDG called Etoile uh, Filon, and it was a completely project-based school, no exams at all. And that's kind of how I teach too. I try to only do projects, just because uh, everyone seems to find their voice in projects. They're messy, and they are, uh, they're valuable because they're usually outward facing into the community, not just the university community, but the actual world. And I think that method of learning, that method of teaching, that method of uh, contributing to the world um, is not necessarily something that's real common uh, Within academia, within the academy, you know, and I think um, Ken refer referred to the the disciplining that we all go through, whether you're a physicist or an architect, and that's your worldview. And it's it's you know it's an issue within the university, but I think we you, what these projects do is allow us to break those down, so that your worldview, a physicist, I'd love to have a physicist on the next design, urban design, you know, uh, project that we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, no, it, it, that's, it's really the most special part. And I think that's when the peer learning also starts to really take off. When you've got a business major in there, talking about ignorance, right? An architect act, asking a business major about money. <laughs> We're horrible at it, you know? We don't teach it. So, I mean, everybody's allowed to be ignorant within that interdisciplinary scenario. And if you cross the borders over to Concordia or UDM or whatever, it even gets more interesting. Because then you've got an institutional worldview that's being challenged, so so to your question, it's my kids' school that really, when I saw how they learned, um, I'm like, this is all I wanna do in my own class. And I already did a healthy dose of it in architecture, but I think we can do a lot better here. And I think we talk a lot about experiential learning, but there's very little support. I teach a lot with uh, people who are studying to be teachers uh, in the far north, in, in uh, Inuit schools and in Cree schools, and the most compelling example I ever heard of, of how somebody made their school work for their student. Um, there was a, a student who had been suspended for whatever reason. Uh, he had hit somebody or something. And the, the rule with the school board was that you weren't al the student wasn't allowed to return to school until their parents had come in for a meeting. And this student's parents never answered the phone, would never come. And, and so this kid was like, well, I, I guess I'm not coming back to school then. And he was 13. And in, in Inuit communities, they have an education committee. So there's a bunch of people in the community who are on the education community, 
Committee. And one of my dear friends, who's been a mentor to me as an educator, and she was a principal at the school at the time, and she was recognizing that her hands were being tied by this systemic rule that was gonna mean that this kid dropped out of school. So she called up people in the education community, and she said, okay, this kid's parents won't come in, and so I want you to be his advocate. And you're gonna come to the meeting, and you're gonna stand in, 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 because his parents can't come in or won't come in, and no matter what I say, you're gonna argue with me. And so if, if, if I say, you know, Willie, you're being suspended because you, know, you just haven't been able to control your anger, then you say, that doesn't sound like the Willie that I know, he's a really good kid, even if it's true. Because Willie needs to feel like somebody is there advocating for him, and somebody is there who cares whether or not he's there, and somebody's gonna fight for him. And I think that we need to be those people for our students. I think we need to fight for their success. I think that they need to trust us that we are fighting for their success, and that we need to look at innovative ways of engaging students and making them feel like they matter. And that's why I'm excited about these conversations, because this is the first place where these things kind of start. Okay, so I'll come back to your original question, which is about my schooling. I have to admit that I think it was a very traditional, these are very traditional schools, uh, of which I have few memories. Um, and so I don't think there was anything systemic in a system, in a school, that struck me or was particularly formative for me. Uh, but there were individual teachers, of course, who were. And, and so uh, one of those was basically, I think, the reason that I got into science and into physics. And looking back on it, uh, it was because his classroom was a little bit what I aspire my classrooms to be now, which is simply a place in which there's no such thing as a bad question. Everything was allowed. Uh, he would respond, you know, in, in a in a dignified way. He brought a lot of humor into his classroom as well. But there were no, you know, there were no like that's a dumb question because I told you yesterday that uh, or anything like that. It was it was really the place that I first saw, and of course at the time I didn't realize it because I didn't have the exposure that I have now. Um, it was the place that I first saw the idea of. Uh, just simply intellectual, you know, anything, anything is allowed intellectually. You can, you know, you can cross any boundary, you can ask any question, there's no such thing as a bad question. Uh, of course, this was in a science, in a, in a science uh, uh, subject, so, you know, the questions had natural limits to them. But, uh, you know, we, we could ask and, and get reasonable discussions on and answers to basically any question. And that was, that was really fantastic. I mean, I didn't realize it until years later that, that was a, that's what had launched me into science uh, and the idea that um, there are no, in a classroom, there should be no wrong questions, no bad questions. There should be just simply questions, uh, questions that lead to discussion, sometimes questions that lead to answers, but always questions. I felt really lucky growing up because I went to a, this kind of alternative school that was really land-based, so we did a lot of stuff outside. And my classes were really small. I had 12 people in my graduating class. And um, uh, I loved every part of that school. The teachers were like my best friends. They were my best advocates. The school felt like an extension of my home. And to be honest, going to university, it was just like a baseball bat to the head because I went to classes and I just did not understand what was going on and I felt completely alienated. And so I guess ever since then, I've just kind of been carrying that experience I had um, from zero to 12 with me. And that's just kind of, I've been trying to recreate that everywhere I go, basically, <laughs> to sum up. So in grade one, I was spanked, so I really didn't like primary school. In high school, I had my dad as my physics teacher, and so I really didn't like high school, and I always said I'd never be a teacher because of those two experiences. Then I got to university and had an amazing math prof who said, you're interested in French literary studies, you're interested in mathematics, that's absolutely fine. You can do an interdisciplinary kind of, you make up the program you need to make up for your interests. And so. That's really what I've tried to 
recreate in the classroom. It's to say, what are your interests? Why, what are you bringing to this classroom? And how can you teach me about them? Um, yeah, this project, I have a student writing a sonata using Wren songs so that she can think through about the non-human sounds. I, I'm learning lots and lots from her, right? So it's, yeah, to kind of create that interdisciplinary space to echo what Michael said. Um, and also, there are no dumb questions, and learning so much from what the student brings from their own interests, but disciplines, right? Um, so that creating that interdisciplinary climate, I think. That was a great question, Jeremy. <laughs> I've learned so much tonight and gotten insights that I never would have had if all of you wouldn't have been as generous with your time to come, but also uh, as generous with us in terms of sharing your own experiences and, and, and including some of the ones that are challenging. I think that's always courageous. And same with students, uh, too. And I'm, I'm hoping that this could be uh, the beginning of a dialogue, which is not to say that dialogues like this aren't having, happening all over campus. They may well be. But, but my dialogue is about, is about the importance of social connectedness and to be able to call out destigmatize and build pathways to overcome social isolation. What I hadn't expected is that that would actually become most important of all in, in, in my very own uh, class, which is building social connectedness and, and, uh, and being that, that an agent of change surrounded by 35 incredible agents of change uh, themselves. I too love literature, and I especially love poetry. And one of my favorite poets at the moment, and for many years, is Mary Oliver. This isn't a poem I'm going to read, though. So, uh, but I wanted to, uh, this is a, a book called Upstream, because this is also the end of our Sauve uh, series on social connectedness for, uh, for this, this year. And uh, I just thought this was a lovely, lo lovely words on which to uh, reflect and uh, share with the, uh, the words I always say to all of my students, I believe in you, and to quote Martin Luther King, who, uh, who also came to class. We had a lot of thinkers and writers and poets that came to class in one form or another, and uh, at one point I showed the, the class a video that wasn't of one of his, his great uh, speeches. It was, uh, it was a talk to a small class in elementary uh, school. In, uh, in Pennsylvania on his way to make one of his great speeches. And he said to the students, remember your somebodiness. And, uh, and I've been reflecting tonight about the importance of somebodiness for everyone, for students, teachers, professors, professors of practice, professor, professors, uh, administrators, and everyone who's part of the, the community that, that makes up this university. And I think if we don't think about it, then uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't tend to get the residence that it, that it should. Anyway, this is, uh, this is just something I wanted to, uh, to read. One tree is like another tree, but not too much. One tulip is like the next tulip but not altogether, more or less like people, a general outline than the stunning individual strokes. Hello, Tom. Hello, Andy. Hello, Archibald Violet and Clarissa Bluebell. Hello, Lillian Willow and Noah, the oak tree. I have hugged and kissed every first day of spring for the last 30 years. And in reply, it's thousands of leaves tremble. What a life is ours. Doesn't anybody in the world anymore want to get up in the middle of the night and sing? That's my wish for everyone here, that we can all sing and sing together. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of you so much for being here tonight. This has been such an insightful discussion. Thank you so much to our panelists. You've brought an amazing depth um, and richness to this, and we really, really appreciate you um, taking the time to spend this evening with us. Um, I want to give a special thanks to three incredible women that are in this room tonight, all of whom have in some way shaped my 
personal growth in university and who have embodied everything that we've been talking about here in terms of compassion and community, and that's Stephanie Posthumus, Rachel Cadell Monroe, and Kim Samuel throughout different points in my university career have really created that classroom where I felt that I can say the wrong answer, where I felt there can be silence in the room, where I've been inspired and been pushed to think critically and really been challenged in ways that I never had. So thank you all so much. And thanks to all the amazing professors who I'm sure have done similar things for many of the students um, in this room here tonight. Um, I would like to say again, thank you so much for all five of you for coming out and sharing your time. And when we're securing the panelists, one of the panelists said to me, I don't think I have anything to contribute. Obviously, that panelist was very wrong. Everybody has something to contribute in this conversation, whether you're a student, a professor, or a member of the community at large. So I think everybody in this room has something to contribute, and we do value your opinion. And finally, I would like to thank Kim Samuels for believing in the two of us and really co-creating co this event with us. Thank we you. We hope that this is not the end of this conversation, that it's just the beginning. Clearly, it's a topic that needs a lot more discussion and there's a lot of interest. So please continue to engage in dialogue about this.